Hey everybody, it's Dan and Ron, and this is a nominee episode six seventeen uh, eighteen. Uh, I think it'd be episode eighteen because we took the last episode, which was the uh, Kevin Smith Jane Silent Bob reboot, and we split it into the spo- non-spoiler and the spoiler edition. Right, and uh, for those of you who've heard that uh, the, the first or second of those episodes, um, or both, you know, for our diehard fan or possibly even fan. <laughs> Possibly plural. Possible, possible plural. There's there's a little parentheses with a with an S at the end of that. Uh-huh. Um, we have another episode about gratuitous lampshade hanging. Yeah, we're yeah, going yeah. back to the source. Yeah, this is nothing but a, a one big giant lampshade. Or a, well, it's it's breaking the fourth wall. So does that mm. count as lampshade? As lampshade hanging? Yeah, I guess like there's not enough effort to make it even look like a movie where it's it's like by the end. Well, I, okay, I, I guess yeah, that's put, a preview. We should go back. The yeah, yeah, yeah. We, so should, we, we watched... didn't even talk what we're talking about. Oh, and by the way, wait, just to make just to make a clear. Spoilers, spoilers, this is full of spoilers, even though there's this is kind of a spoiler-proof movie. This movie's 79 years old, um, <laughs> and it's free on the internet, so go watch it, and then come back here. Um, this episode of the podcast might even end up being longer than the movie, potentially, right. <laughs> um, and uh, it's well worth your time, I think. I, I really enjoyed that, um, but we watched Hell's a Poppin', which is... Uh, H-E-L-L. L Z A P P O I no P O P P I N. Thank you. Apostrophe exclamation point. Right. Um, right. And it's uh, yeah, it's from 1941. So and as Ron helpfully pointed out, it was released three months after Citizen Kane. Because they spoil Citizen Kane. <laughs> they spoil yeah, spoiler warning for Hell's a Pop and Citizen Kane. And we also we watched a Super Friends episode, which we haven't done in a couple of our episodes. Yeah, yeah. Which is good. We're, we're kind of rationing them because I, I still only have the two sets. But, uh, <laughs> There's 14 years worth or whatever it was, but we only have um, what, yeah. I mean, we, if 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 we run out of Super Friends episodes before we run out of podcasts, that'll be oh, yeah. we'll be like past our hundredth episode by then. Yeah, <laughs> um, well past our hundredth episode. So there's our goal to go at least a hundred episodes. Right, we missed the Super by. Friends for a couple episodes, so right. we're gonna have we're gonna have to have more episodes than a thing that ran for fourteen years right. before we run out of Super <laughs> Friends episodes. So uh, we're uh, we're good for a while. Yeah. So Hell's a Pop in 1941. Uh, you have a comedy duo that I believe was uh, very famous on the radio at the time. One of them is named Ollie, and no, it's, you're talking Olson and Johnson. Oh, Olson. Olson and Johnson, okay, yeah, and um, and that's definitely some errata territory there because like I can't, rem- I feel like I've heard them on because I went on like an old time radio binge when I thought I was going to become a cartoonist when I was in college. I just put on like the the OTR archive on archive.org like for I mean I probably heard like 120 episodes of the like Martin and Lewis Colgate. Oh wow, wow, comedy whatever. And, Wait, what's OTR? Uh, old time radio. That's oh, okay. Like, the, right. It's like the texting abbreviation for people who the the demographic overlap between people who need texting abbreviations and people who are still listening to eighty year old radio programs. Was it Fibber, Fibber McGee and Molly? Fibber McGee and Molly. Uh, they mentioned the, the original of- Amos and Andy. That was originally a radio program. Um, I mean, there's like hundreds upon hundreds of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jack Benny. Like maybe not. The- yeah, Jack Benny was originally on the radio uh you know and that that's only comedy stuff like there were tons of drama mystery right. a good number of sci-fi shows some of the sci-fi ones are actually still pretty good the um like dimension x is pretty fun oh. and like in canada they were still producing things in that format up through the 80s and there was um God, there was an amazing sci-fi anthology radio drama program that was on Canadian radio in the 80s that I can't remember what the name of it was, um, but that'll be something to look up for next episode. Anyway, so Hell's a Poppin'. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm just suddenly remembering other radio shows. <laughs> so there was Orson Welles, right? The Mercury... Um, yep, the Orson Welles Mercury, Mercury Theater. Mm-hmm. There was... Um, the Shadow. The Shadow, Box 13 with Alan. 
Alan Ladd. Uh, I think there was a Doc Savage. Like anything that was in a pulp magazine eventually mm-hmm. got turned into a radio program because you could produce those things. Sorry, I just brought them up because I was thinking of them, so I just had to. <laughs> <laughs> they were ready to burst. I'm like, wait, wait, before I mention that, here's a couple more that are famous. You know, the, especially the, I mean, the Orson Welles Mercury Theater. That's where we got War of the World. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was listening to radio. And, and um, yeah, radio was huge. Um, it was totally a writer's medium because there was no need for production value really beyond just making sure the microphone's set up and you can make a couple sound effects. Um, and they would come out with... Already. Right. Yeah, like a closing door, like all those private eye programs. Yeah, they must yeah. use the same recording of just a door opening and closing every time the fact that Tal walks into the office. A metal... Uh, was it a, a metal... Sh- uh, some sheet metal uh, to make the sound of uh, thunder, st- thunder. Right. Now we have like very advanced Foley effects like for Goodfellas uh, whenever somebody's kicking somebody you notice how it's like this the really satisfying just whacking noise and mm-hmm. you know what that's actually a recording of what? they couldn't figure out how to get the sound just quite right so eventually the guy resorted he brought a frozen turkey uh-huh. into the recording <laughs> studio and started whacking it with a baseball bat oh wow that's awesome and that's like the sound you're hearing a lot of the time when somebody starts kicking somebody in a mob movie all right specifically in goodfellas or or uh, specifically in goodfellas but i think a lot of them i feel like they reuse a lot of those uh-huh. noises um oh it's like uh, the laugh track all the laugh tracks are the, that same one that was recorded i don't know 60 years ago well so the laugh the track um, the laugh track was originally, it was a family business. There was one, it was an actual instrument. It was like, it looked like a keyboard piano. Huh. Uh, it was technically the first Mellotron, but yeah, they just recorded a bunch of different six to 12 second loops of like people making different kinds of audio noises or like crowd noises. Uh-huh. And they would rent out somebody from this family and supposedly people back in the day could actually like in the industry would specifically request like the son or the wife or something because they did a better job playing it for whatever genre. And yeah, and they would just hit different keys on this makeshift keyboard. Um, And the actually original laugh track machine, it sold for like $10,000, I think eight years ago on eBay. Um, what if it still works? Probably, yeah. I mean, if the tape hasn't decayed. I mean, the tape probably has gotten stretched out because it was, like, literally every show with a laugh yeah. track that didn't have a live audience was but that could be restored. hiring these people. Or you found that you get another, you replace it with a with a, with a clean tape. Yeah, yeah. Or is it an old, uh, the, the, the taping, is it an older technology that's obsolete? And Well, it's reel-to-reel tape. Like, we're, we're talking about actual, like, you know, you're cutting it with scissors. And, like, oh, that kind of, okay, something. all right. So there might be other, well, I want to say prints, but uh, other copies. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, or you could literally just take it off old TV recordings. Cause oh, yeah, you're the right. Because the kinescopes, it's... like, they're playing, you know, a lot of times they'd be playing multiple of, recording, of the recordings at once because it actually worked. Uh-huh. Like, a, you know, like a Mellotron is, um, it's basically just a bunch of Walkmans hooked up to a keyboard, yeah. right? That's what the, that's the weird noise at the beginning of, um strawberry fields forever Uh that's why it kind of like warbles at the beginning and end oh okay um so there's this um there's an old church in amsterdam uh, called the old church, the Audekerk, um, Audekerk, not Kerk, um, wrong language. Um, it's this big, giant um, stone church, very, very empty, very mm-hmm. stark. Um, although it does have giant windows that let the let the light in, but they do art installations. Um, I don't know if the church mm-hmm. is active at all. Um, there is a little mm-hmm. area in the middle that could be, but but it's mostly for art installations. Anyways, one that they did uh, a couple of years ago was uh, there was a small keyboard. It wasn't a full eighty-eight keys. I don't think. Mm-hmm. I think it was a shorter version. And each each key let out a sound, mm. so um, or a sound on, on loop. So mm. one of them actually had some um, uh, like. So yeah, by uh, technical definitions, that's a mellotron. Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. so one of them actually had a symphony. It was actually like mm. uh, musical instruments. Another one was a helicopter, the sound of a helicopter. Another <laughs> one was I don't know. So 
somebody coughing. So. Mm, right, right. <laughs> Another one was sounds uh, like in the street and all that. So, but you you could play multiples of those at once. So you're playing the symphony, and then you bring in the helicopter, and then replace it with the street sounds, a gunfire, mm. stuff like that. But all while this music is playing, so it sounds a little <laughs> bit like something for platoon, right. or uh, or full metal, uh, not full metal jacket, or like a, the apocalypse now apocalypse soundtrack. Now, right, where you got oh god, I got, I got a good story about the apocalypse <laughs> now soundtrack. Uh huh. What is it? Okay, so I think it was better. Yeah, it had to be better. It was either Veterans Day or Memorial Day because there were a bunch of those like little tiny American flags planted in all the like flower planters in downtown in the town where I grew up. Uh And I knew this guy and he had, you know, we were both like high school age and but he had a car he had like some 70s like beat to shit car and he only had he was a huge movie guy and i think he only had four audio cassettes and there one of them was the apocalypse now soundtrack with you know flight of the valkyries yeah. i was i was called uh, ride of the valkyries but that's like a motorcycle yeah. thing it's not called ride of the valkyries it's called flight wait i'm pretty sure it's called flight of the valkyries yeah because okay. somebody called me out on that once because i wrote like ride of the valkyries and I'm like oh i didn't know you we're into motorcycles and it's like oh wait <laughs> but anyway so we're kind of bored we can't really figure out what to do to kill time no you were wait i'm seeing it this, i'm looking it up is I it right the, oh okay yeah i mean technically it's in german so you can translate it to anything that sounds about right but uh anyway so so we're bored we grab a couple of these tiny american flags we get into this guy's car there were four of us in, including uh the guy driving the car and he just puts in the the flight of the valkyries tape with the gunshot noises turns it full blast and then we just keep circling the middle of the downtown waving <laughs> these tiny flags we took out of a planter for like 10 minutes american flags or uh, yeah like little american flags Okay. And um and eventually the cops pulled us over and mm. like the, the you know he's super anxious you know he's like oh god, god I, I, we 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 met it out of respect yeah, first lie <laughs> like, um, it was, and it was an homage yeah yeah and she she pulls us over and, and he's like freaking out and she says what happened to uh, the flags. And he's like, we, we can give it back, we can give it back. It's like, oh, well, you, you know, we, we kind of, we, we like the tribute you guys were given. You know, she's just like trolling us worse than we troll downtown. <laughs> and so we had to do like one last lap of shame with Flight of the Valkyries playing again. And then I, I think we like uh, took the first turn to Denny's after that. <laughs> you got trolled, trolled <laughs> by a cop. I mean, at least they didn't like. Oh, yeah, when, when we got to Denny's, we, we just like. Like, we wouldn't stop making fun of the guy. Like, I think she likes you. I think that's yeah. why she pulled you over. <laughs> um, did she Did she ask for a phone number, or did she give her? No, no, she just said, like, what happened to the flags, guys? We were getting into it, you yeah. know, and... And that was that was that. That's funny. All right, so they were getting a kick out of somebody. <laughs> they knew you weren't breaking any laws, just uh Yeah, we were just being like teenagers. I was yeah. gonna say dicks, but we were being dicks, yeah. but also teenagers. I could see that being fun. Like if I saw that and we saw it, and we're like, wow, okay. The first time, like, what the hell was that? And the second time, it's them again. The third time's like, okay, yeah, I get, it. I'm into it. That's who, you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah, so. nothing says like God bless America, like German opera and gunshots, <laughs> right? Like, and look little waving plastic flags <laughs> right <laughs> the, um, whole, the whole combo i don't know what year was this god this had to be i mean i was in high school so it had to be at the very least 12 years ago okay so we're t- i'm just wondering no how, uh, 13 years ago well what i'm wondering is did you know apocalypse now did you know that that was from that or or is that something that just people just know about i love the smell of napalm in the morning and the ride of the valkyries in the helicopters I mean, I think people definitely recognize, because if you just hum that to somebody, I feel yeah. like most people would recognize it. When I had the, the guy who'd broken his hands five times open and for me, playing music on his knuckles when I was doing stand-up, also in high school, um, that was like one of the requests that he would always get. And, you know, one of the things he could play pretty, you know, he wouldn't play the whole thing, obviously, but uh-huh. he, he would play uh, the famous part on his knuckles. Um 
Yeah, I mean, that's like one of the most famous, like that's as famous as Ode to Joy or fucking yeah. Hot Cross Buns. Yeah. That's my really bad German pronunciation. <laughs> I'm sorry to all you German speakers out there, or at least the native German speakers, for hurting your ears. <laughs> um, by the way, I looked it up, the Valkyries. So so Wagner's piece is Ride of the Valkyries. Flight of the Valkyries is an annual metal festival with editions held in St. Paul, Minnesota, and beginning in... Oh, wait, so I mixed it up again, because that's what they were telling me about. Yeah, so you were wow, right. so I Ride just corrected myself wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And got, yeah. like, enamorated. You got enamorated, like, on the spot. <laughs> Real-time enamorada. Yeah. So when so, you say it's right, when it really is flight, that's errata. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so how's it popping? Uh, I want to give a plot, but it's not. I guess it's described the movie as as opposed to a plot per se. I mean, I feel like they kind of give you the the two sentence description at the beginning of the movie when the when they say like we're making a motion picture here, and the guy walks by and says that's a matter of opinion. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, well they break the fourth wall constantly so there's a constant reference to this being a movie to the point that at one point there's a sign comes up and it says uh, stinky go home mm. and then a few minutes later another sign comes up the stinky your mother is, is trying to get a hold of you and then fi- another uh, sign comes up about stinky and the actors stop they look into the audience and say stinky will you go home already it's, <laughs> your mother's waiting for you something like that right then a silhouette then, pops up on the screen a stinky leaving the theater yeah and yeah that that's kind of like one of they talk to the projectionist yeah. yeah the projectionist gets his own plot line which i think that's the only movie where that's ever happened right, that right i can right. think of except for a cinema paradiso oh that's true that's within the uh right that's within the, the parody so that's not like the guy projecting the print of cinema parody so right, right, right. um that's cinema paradiso too i can see you <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh-huh. Yeah, so so right, the two line synopsis. Um, yeah, and they they kind of predict. A lo- I was kind of shocked. There were like echoes of every major thing, practically, except maybe the Mary Tyler Moore show that happened on TV comedy from like 1950 to 1995. Mm-hmm. Like they do the Simpsons rape gag, and they do it multiple times, just like the Simpsons did it. Like yeah, yeah, the guy, and I, I feel like where the Simpsons writers probably saw this and it was a reference because there's like a lot of like really are like deep cut deep cut kind of right, right. pop culture references in the first like 10 years of the Simpsons but uh, yeah they, they do the like the ballet falling apart thing before Ernie Kovacs did it with the people in gorilla suits they did uh, what it, I mean there's basically like a miniature episode of mystery science theater within right, the right, movie right, right. commenting on the fake movie that the movie isn't but is supposed to be you've suddenly got three of the people in the movie watching the movie without sound and making up dialogue <laughs> right and you can see their heads just like uh, yeah, yeah. What, what, what is it joel something or other and the the two robots crow and yeah, yeah. mr mr stanky or whatever his name is um so that's a well there's there's a bit of a love story and there's a there's a mixed up uh this woman is going out with one guy or she's in a relationship with one guy but she's actually in love with another guy uh, martha ray is another woman and uh, there's this account or something like that uh, or, or prince who's looking for a rich woman because um, he only has the title but not the money but right. he thinks that he's being matched up with Martha Ray they very quickly realize that's not the case she is not a rich woman but she starts chasing him all, all over the place he's not interested in her I don't know there's mistaken identity there's that first woman there's uh, it's confused and think that the prince uh, well basically had sex with her when actually it was Martha Ray uh, using her room. Uh, eventually that all gets resolved and Martha Ray leads a big dance number. It, it's like a version of Airplane where you actually get to see Zucker, whatever his name, like sabotage the plane so it crashes basically. Like. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but then the jokes, get, or then they comment on the jokes. Yeah, yeah, just sort of, yeah, just like it's this thing eating itself. Uh-huh. Um, so this is based on, so just looking at the, looking this up. So Olsen and Johnson are the, the two main, which is, by the way, later uh, there's a joke about this in Blazing Saddles, about the names uh, Olsen and Johnson. Hmm. They, uh, oh, so this originally was based on a review, on a musical review. That makes a um, lot of sense. Did. Yeah. So I don't know, it, it, what I can't tell was if there was any kind of plot or anything tying it all together in the way there was in this movie. Because this movie looked like there were a bunch of musical dance numbers that had nothing to do with each other. They were part of... Well, that's what the review genre was. Like, if you ever saw, like, Follies or, like, Gold Diggers of 1933, 34, insert year, but Gold Diggers of blank, the blank year Follies, um, except the Titicut Follies, that is not a music... That's a very different... Musical number shit. It um. That's uh oh. There's although actually wait no it is it is named after though because the in the high school they're or not in the in the the mental hospital I'm confusing that with the next Frederick Wiseman movie um they're putting on as the high as the musical they're putting on the Titicut Follies right uh, or not in the I mean in the yeah the mental hospital that's why the movie's called that yeah. Um, but it, but, but that was an incredibly popular genre that sort of, uh, the film versions are kind of the, the earliest antecedent to something like MTV where they're showing music videos. There's literally no emphasis on plot whatsoever. Sometimes it's even just the musical numbers cut out of other movies and just spliced together as like mm-hmm. a greatest hits kind of thing. So imagine an hour of Katy Perry videos. Uh, yeah, pretty much, except with like a lot of synchronized swimming because that was right. one was hot back then i was thinking of the baby sharks oh yeah Um, yeah, we see, let's see, we see, uh, the dance musical numbers or the, or the songs. We see that sort of passport one. We get a Spanish dance in which the, the main singer, like, is evocative of Carmen Miranda mm. with the fruit on, on the head. Uh, we see a completely gratuitous, um, underwater or in the water. Well, and the, 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 the Prince guy in the beginning that's like going after, uh, what was it, George Clooney's aunt? Uh, what's her Martha name? Ray. Martha, Martha Ray. <laughs> Ray's like going after her and then figures out, uh oh no money you know and then she's like chasing him that was definitely supposed to be satirizing like all the the cliches of like screwball comedies right because there's like the the kind of generic foreign guy that the rich people keep (laughs) around like a pet like my man godfrey is one of those um pretty much any like screwball comedy that doesn't involve reporters because like reporters (laughs) there's no reason for them to have like a random generic ambiguous foreign person person following them around. Hey, what do you see? Stop the presses. we got a story here. We've got a bunch of demons. we got demons and di- demons from the hell. They're coming and they're destroying this whole family. Oh, they're yeah, trying they to talk. soar Discord. So Discord. So sore. It's all the same to me. They talk so quickly and, and granted, like, yeah, all, all those old screwball comedies, like, everybody's talking a mile a minute and like, to the point, like I feel like in 2019 if somebody comes up to you and talks like that it's almost diagnosable, like... Right, 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 right. Yeah, when I do you know, it can be a, a force speech <laughs> Right. That's when I get, uh, 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 what's it called? I, I've described it as, I feel like I'm talking faster than I'm thinking. Um, Which so, yeah. for me is just called like Tuesday. But, <laughs> um, um, yeah. Wait, how did we get on that? Uh, oh, well, they, they talk really quickly. The uh, There's, I feel like it's equal parts satire of the musical review genre and the screwball comedy genre, both of which would have been in decline around 1941. Uh, but we're were still, you know, like, in order to go into decline, they had to have peaked, like, very soon beforehand. So that yeah. was... You look through, like, box office numbers in the 30s, people wanted... People really wanted escapist entertainment, uh-huh. right? And uh, musicals, yeah. I mean, that's why it was the, like, 30s through... I mean, I feel like the golden age of musicals is pretty much over by... Of film musicals is pretty much over by 1950. Okay. And, I mean, I, I don't know if it ever really came back... Just musicals, were... musicals. Because later we get stuff like Gene Kelly. But right. those aren't musicals in the same... You, you don't have those big, giant musical numbers. Well, well, no, and Singing do. in the Rain is a meta musical about the collapse of the golden age of musicals. Right, right. Um, As they introduce talkies. And, uh... Right, and it's... Uh, well, that comes a little later. They, they didn't 
put those kind of, and I feel like when they put resources into musicals later on, like I'm thinking, uh, you know, Chicago, which I don't know how that won Best Picture of the Year. It did, but it did. <laughs> uh, Richard Gere. I know, it took me, uh, I did not like Chicago at the time. It took me years to finally appreciate it. And even then, I only appreciate a few songs. Yeah, I, I just yeah. remember my mother took me and I was like, oh, it's like people who can't really dance or sing trying to do, like, we did this at the high school last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was watching and I was like, what is this shit? Why, why are they doing this? Like, this is the thing that Richard Gere has belonged in the least since yeah. Breathless, right? Because <laughs> everybody forgets there's a remake of, there's an English language remake of John Luke Godard's Breathless starring Richard Gere, which maybe we should watch that for the podcast. I, I feel like that could... Watch, I mean, have watch you ever, both. Watch the original. Oh, yeah, have you ever seen the original Breathless? No. Well, no. actually, I might have. Yeah, I don't, you know, there was a, a friend of mine, he used to take me um, to, uh, to movies like that. Mm. And so I was very... I was very cultured for a while because I used to see <laughs> stuff like that. That's how I ended up watching a bunch of Ozu films. Right. There was an Ozu festival. He actually didn't know much about Ozu himself, but we started watching all these movies, and so we became Ozu aficionados. Well, no, it was Ozu. only a few. I months. mean, Ozu is like the holy trinity of like world cinema. Is like Ozu, Brisson, and Dreyer uh -huh. for me. Um, yeah, I mean, like it. Ooh. How do we make an Ozu movie? <laughs> Take your camera, put it on the tripod, have it face an open doorway. <laughs> wait two hours. Hit record and wait two hours. <laughs> I, well, I guess I left well, out. You, you, instruct you, the actors to you watch. You have to have like a one-minute shot of a train station somewhere. Yeah, 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 okay. So, yeah, the people have to get to that room that the hallway is uh, uh, or that the, behind the doorway. Yeah, yeah, you need the actors to actually like be somehow situated in that doorway. They might be sitting on either side of it. Hmm. They might be standing. They might be walking across it. But, yeah, that's... I mean, he's, yeah, like if, if, the, if Japanese society had embraced chairs the way we did, there would be no Ozu. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, people would be moving. <laughs> like, they're sitting, but they would be moving the chair. Well, you can't just, like, put the... Because, like, you get the sense with Ozu that, like, he's putting the camera on basically just another table exactly the height of the table the person's eating at or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite uh, scenes in cinema is from um, Tokyo Story. Mm. And that's where the, the 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 aging parents come to stay with their kids. They have a bunch of kids. Mm. I mean, adult, adult children. And they try to stay stay with each one of them and they keep getting passed off to to another uh, and at one point they go to and uh, this isn't a spoiler it's just a spoiling a scene um uh, Ozu is one of those guys where like he would remake his own movies sometimes I, mean, I think he remade he remade a few black and white movies in color right well or, I mean he remade some of the some of the black and white movies basically in black and white because like mm. late spring and an autumn afternoon like they're not the same movie but he he was a, a, Last episode, I was talking about, like, you know, the, the great directors are very obsessive people when they keep coming back to these same couple things. I think he's, like, the epitome of that. Okay. Like, he cared, like, plot was the least interesting thing in the world to that guy, if I yeah, had yeah, any yeah. sense. And so he can remake the same movie, basically, and you still come away with this sense of, like... It's more like going to a restaurant and having a really good meal and then ordering it again and still <laughs> thinking it's really good as opposed to like, um, you know, going to, to see a movie two times in a row. Right, right? where we like know it's going to be You can eat the identical. same food two days in a row and you're like, oh man, it's still really good. You right, know, like, right. Um, oh, but just what I was going to say about that, that, that image. Well, so much of Ozu is visual, even if it's mm -hmm. the camera is still and it's it's people coming into and leaving the the um, the the frame um yeah i can't think of a single like tracking shot in any i mean yeah. i haven't seen all of them but like but they um so the couple the older couple they go um for a picnic or just mm -hmm. they get sandwiches and they walk onto this little grass plot but it's in the middle of this of this giant intersection so it's sort of like you know you've got a whole bunch of roads going from each direction cars going fast and they've got the little tiny island in the middle that's where they're having their their picnic which is it, that island is intended for anyone to walk onto period it's just to help with the uh it, just part of the traffic pattern um but they use it as as their little their little piece of heaven mm. um as a little slice of country life yeah he had like the most poetic way of implying kind of this tragedy of modernity encroaching that 
like I, I don't think anybody's ever quite done that as well as like late spring the the scene where she's kind of realized or where the do you ever see late spring uh, maybe it's the one where I, and I, I say this after saying there's like five movies with the same plot right did, but, uh, yeah the uh, the daughter lives with she's like 28 she lives with her father I've seen it yeah oh well it could be one of five like that it's <laughs> it's in black and white it's from 1948 and she's just found out that she's being married off to some guy who apparently looks like Gary Cooper uh-huh. and she's just riding her bicycle and in in the distance you know, I didn't even notice it the first time I saw it but there's just the Coca-Cola sign uh-huh. and, and I thought that's like that's such like a beautiful poetic parallel to draw between um, this kind of collapse of traditional Japanese culture due to cultural diffusion that came with the uh, you know the U.S. occupation after the war um, and just sort of the, the necessity yeah the necessary yet inherently tragic elements of time moving forward and the ideas of progress and, and that, that just always really hit me. Well, well, we should yeah. do an Ozu. We should watch. A... No, we could what do? We could watch Tokyo Story, and then there's an American remake of it. There's an American remake. Oh, oh, uh, a Make Way for Tomorrow. By yes, Lee. yes, yeah, yeah. Which I have on Which... DVD. Oh, make wasn't it made before Tokyo Story though? Because Make Way oh, for Tomorrow first. that was in 1937. Tokyo Story was 19. So Tokyo Story is a remake of that. I oh, really no. doubt that Wait Make Way for Tomorrow ever made it to Japan. So I yeah. feel like they're just two people making movies about very similar I mean it's a pretty universal theme like alienation between adult children and their parents um I have not seen Make Way for Tomorrow though I I did want to see that um that's Leo McCary, right? Because he was no. It's Leo the same McCary, guy who yeah. directed Duck Soup. Yeah, yeah. Which is really weird to think about. Who was also one of the number twos? Um, oh, uh, one of the number twos in The Prisoner. And I just got a message. Wait, he was? Yeah, yeah. Holy. Oh, okay, my mind's blown. I've got to. I'll, I'll look it up. So we're back with the uh, in episode errata the second time this episode. I think that's just it's not a sign that we're unorganized. I think it's a sign that we're just getting so good that it doesn't take us a week to do the stuff. And when when I say us, like I mean well, I guess it's us now, but like Ron did all the heavy lifting on that stuff, so I don't want it to come across <laughs> like. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess it wasn't that heavy I contributed by making the mistakes. You know, so <laughs> no, I, no, I made most of the mistakes. Credit where credits do. Yeah. But <laughs> all right, the cat is walking. The pod cat is walking across the pod. The pod oh, she wants to go on a kitty ride. Yeah. That's uh, still recording. Still recording. And the, and the cat did a cute thing that, you know... Cat. All my friends with cats have this, the cat walking across the keyboard. I don't have that because I don't have a cat. So this yeah. is exciting. <laughs> the cat is back on the table. Ron has but accessed now, the zeitgeist. The cat is now sniffing my water glass. Anyways, the errata. The errata. The, the errata. So uh, Leo McCary was not number two on The Prisoner or any other number for that matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, when he was sent to the village, it was probably a retirement village, which is especially <laughs> ironic given that we're talking about Make Way for Tomorrow. Um, but he was a very successful person in Hollywood. I'm sure it was a very nice retirement village. Yeah. Kind of like the one in The Prisoner. You know, like if I got retired there, eh, You'd be got, happy there. They got activities. You got a, a nice little cottage, you know. They they got, like, they put you on dates, like whether you want it or not. Yeah, they, they've got uh, your whole schedule worked out for you, whether you like it or not. And, uh, you know, and, like, the number it. thing, it, it kind of... On the one hand, it's sort of dehumanizing. On the other hand, it gets rid of, like, class race issues, you know, right, kind of like school so. uniforms. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and... Uh, On the uniform way, I can't remember, would they vary? And, like, for my time working in a retirement home for, like, aging missionary priests, a lot of those guys would dream about meeting number two, and that's why they'd ask me to microwave their cranberry juice for them. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, so we know that Make Way for Tomorrow was... Um, it was 36 or 37, right? Uh, 37. 37. The Tokyo okay. Story was uh, 50, uh, 53, I think. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> so a little, little off on Tokyo Story. Yeah. So was it the other way around? The Tokyo Story is based on uh, Make Way for Tomorrow? Did they, or do they just have similar stories? I think they just have similar stories. Uh, have you ever seen any of Ozu's like earlier silent films? Because they're pretty like rowdy comedies. There's a lot of fart jokes. There's a lot of like that would be a good thing to do for the podcast. Like uh, I was born, but dot dot dot. That's a great movie that looks nothing like what we traditionally think of an Ozu movie being. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, we think of them being kind of serious, uh, but with with talking, but little talking. They're very quiet, right? Like uh, they're not they're not rip roaring comedy. Yeah, it's kind of like life goes forward and he cuts out all the events, right? You never see like a <laughs> wedding or anything like that. It's just it cuts and then they're talking about man, that was that was a wedding, huh? <laughs> you know, like um, but yeah. So the the actual number two in the prisoner who was like the most prominent number two. Um, not that you know, I know there's that stereotype about men concerned about the size of their shit, but like Leo McCurdy he shows up in more episodes as number two than anybody else he's in I mean he's the only number two where he basically gets a feature episode right like the second to last episode it's pretty much just him and McGowan in a room yeah uh, and then he's also in the finale the like very still one of my favorite episodes of television period ever uh, fallout um, it forever changed the Beatles for me you know the all you need is love sequence as he's walking out uh, and oh, he's I, just I I don't remember the. Uh, I don't remember that as the music in the background. I don't remember what it was. Oh, they might not have licensed it on your copy. Oh, Maybe okay. I don't. Well, no, no, no it's no, possible no. it's there. Just it's been so long since I uh, since I watched it. Oh yeah, and we were going to do the the prisoner cast with the pod guest. Yeah, too, because she's never that. seen it. We've got to do it with the pod guest and with the uh, the Potteraptor. The Potteraptor. Uh, yeah, well, that... you know, I don't want to use names unless they're okay with it. So. Uh, oh yeah, I'm trying. Uh, I can't trying think, think of who the Potteraptor. Is. Oh okay, it's not me. Is it like no, 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 no? It's C. Oh, all oh, right, right, right. Um, so um, uh, that's based on one of our nicknames. Yeah, um, and we, uh, I have. Well, we have options because you have. You said you have Blu-rays, right? I have no. My no, you got the DVD. Oh, so yeah. you got the A and E set that came out. Then the uh, the like the the one where it's. I think it's. It's it's like ten discs, two episodes a disc. It has like the recut version of the pilot that was sent out with like a minute of different footage on it. So I have seventeen laser. No, no, not seventeen laser. I have sixteen laser discs because they were releasing it one episode per laser disc at thirty five bucks a pop in the nineteen eighties. But you didn't pay for that. You didn't pay thirty five bucks a pop. No. So I went to In Your Ear Records um, in. Uh, the the one in Alston, I think, or maybe it's technically downtown Boston, but they had all of them except for the first two episodes. And uh, for two bucks a pop, and I said, will you take 30 for it? And the guy was like, sure, because they've been sitting there for like probably two years. Yeah, yeah. And I actually... And one one of the awesome like in your ear is one of my favorite record stores like ever. It it's just like hoarder madness, but they know their shit and they have just a bag of like any kind of remote controls that they don't have a thing to put to buck a pop. And at the time, I was making a lot of money on eBay flipping remote controls for like high end Blu Ray players and things like that. And so I grabbed like five or six that I figured were worth some money and. And I ended up making about 125 bucks on those prisoner DVDs because oh, nice. the guy was just like, "Oh, you're gonna take those, and you take the remotes, 30 bucks. Just like never bring them back here." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, I picked up the last, the the first two episodes, which were on a double sided laser disc off of eBay, like later, just because I was like, I've, "I've come this far. I need, I need the rest of it." Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, the thing I was most excited about was just having Fallout, and they look great on laser disc you know because it's it's a uh, it's analog video that it's not restored uh-huh. um so the colors look a lot darker because i think the a and e dvds of the prisoner um 
the color correction, there, there is a tendency towards over brightening the color correction so it looks a lot more pastel mod in 60s than it actually probably did on television at the time. Uh-huh. Um, uh, anyway, so, uh, and that's like the crown jewel of my Laserdisc collection, like that, and uh, well, Twilight you know, of the cro- Cockroaches. I'm just looking it up, and uh, The Prisoner is included with Amazon Prime. Oh, crazy. Streaming. So we have three options. Yeah. I wonder, how do you think that compares? I mean, it's probably from the Blu-ray remaster, so I don't know how much, because usually when they would do the DVD remasters, I think they, most of the companies realized, like, DVD's not going to be here forever. There's going to be something higher quality. Also, The Prisoner is one of those very few TV shows where I'm fairly sure there have been theatrical engagements for parts of it, uh-huh. you know, like niche movie houses. Uh, like, I'm the Alamo Draft House out in Boston has probably done a prisoner marathon with some kind of themed food, mm-hmm. um, which that, that would have been fun. I don't know what the themed food would have been, but like when they showed the Simpsons movie, you could get like a cheeseburger on two fried halves of a donut, uh-huh. but only for that screening. Um, <laughs> you know, or they, they showed yes. like all three extended War of the Rings movies with a themed Hobbit feast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the... Uh, oh God, all three Lord of the Riddens movies extended when they uh yeah i never i made it through the first one in the theater and i never went i mean grant i'm not like i'm not a big fan of the i I just don't i just i can't get it up for the lord of the rings no me neither i think i I mentioned this before (laughs) but i read through page 100 of fellowship put it down a few years later again read through page 100 of fellowship put it back down never had any desire to read any to read try reading it again the movies uh well, you know, they're supposed to be true enough to the uh, to the books. Although, mm-hmm. I mean, the people did have complaints about stuff, and I guess... Uh, and it's not like the, the books... I mean, the books are pretty racist if you're, like, reading it carefully. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to read that carefully. Yeah, you don't have to read that carefully. And, like, the thing is, yes, um, Tolkien had some fairly interesting ideas about, like, language and grammar. But if I'm going to read that much... And I'm just looking for interesting ideas about language. Like, I could push my way through most of Wittgenstein before I finish Lord (laughs) of the Rings. Um, And there might be less walking and talking in Wittgenstein. Oh, way less. You know, he doesn't, you know, he's just like, they're wearing chainmail armor. No, 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 he never says that. No, he's a... But that's all he'd say. And they were wearing chainmail armor. They walked for three days. (laughs) Right. (laughs) They reached Rivendell. (laughs) Right. And each of those sentences would be numbered. Because, like, Wittgenstein, I got to say, out of all of those classic philosopher guys in the 20th century he got straight to the fucking point like the um shit the really famous one is only 80 pages and then the one that was like his his like the end of his life's work is Uh it's still only about 300 pages which 300 pages you're not even to like the meaty stuff and say like heidegger but you know heidegger was also a nazi so uh (laughs) wittgenstein seemed like very eccentric given also but not a nazi yeah he was a good guy for the most part he grew up in a bunch of money and then decided like i'm gonna go teach school children and volunteer for the hell medical corps in the army like wow i did not know that that's the one with the poker right is it wittgenstein's poker no who's poker uh who hits who with the poker that is a good question do you know uh, what i'm talking about uh, maybe it's not Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein is like the one who kind of comes up with a compatible compatibilist idea of language about halfway between kind of radical postmodernism afterwards and those kind of like very rigid notions of language as a set of like repeatable universal rules that exist before his work. Um, yeah, God. it's Wittgenstein's uh, poker. That's uh, the story of a 10-minute argument between two great philosophers, uh, between Karl Popper and, and Wittgenstein. Mm. And I think it just gets, I forget what it was, but he gets mad at the end and hits him with a with a poker, like a fire poker. That sounds like Fireplace Wittgenstein, poker. yeah. Does? Okay, all right. Yeah, there's I like a Freeman story. Dyson who somehow is still alive. He's got to be like 95 now, uh, who was involved with the Manhattan Project. He actually went to a school where Wittgenstein taught and he has the every once in a while he writes a, an article for the New York Review of Books and he'll just throw in a random story about what a weird dude Ludwig Wittgenstein was. <laughs> 
Um, um, oh yeah. So so wow. Okay, wow. We've we've gone really off the far off the mark. Uh, <laughs> hell's a poppin. Yeah, it's, we're we're lampshade hanging about a lampshade hanging. Oh yeah and, yeah, and a guy literally hangs a lampshade in the movie before that was even a term. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then he lights it up because he's got the whole he's got the lamp <laughs> along with the lampshade. They even they make the kitchen sink joke. You yep, know, they say, the somebody classic. Somebody says we have everything but the kitchen sink, and the other guy goes outside of the room for a moment and comes back with the kitchen sink. And I gotta say, Which is still out of funny, like, you know it's coming. Of all the kitchen sink jokes, they put some they put some legwork into this. This one has two faucets. It looks like halfway to be in a tub. Yeah, yeah. This is a serious is, uh, uh, sink. Yeah. yeah, they go all out. Not the, one of those tiny little uh, basins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really hard to describe this movie because. Uh, oh right, it's so like a the commercial love, kitchen. Yeah. I went through and described the the sort of the love story, not quite a love triangle, but mistaken identity. But it's mostly all the stuff that happens in the background in the. Forest foreground all the stuff having to do with it, them recognizing that it's a movie in which they're talking about trying to put on a broadway show or take the show to broadway right um, well it's a broadway show that becomes a movie about making a broadway show which becomes a movie about destroying a broadway show that only exists in the movie which is based <laughs> On a Broadway show. Yeah, there's a, there's a producer's <laughs> kind of thing. So we're saying all these things that are antecedents of what comes later. Probably yeah. they must be. Uh, 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 this movie must have inspired all these people. So that the producers, you've got a little bit of the story of the producers in which there's the two guys who try to tank the show. Um, um, and, uh, and, like, um, and it ends up being really funny and the, mm. the producer loves it and says, yeah, let's, let's put this on Broadway. Yeah. And it's as close as you get to like blackout sketch comedy, uh, like what you would see on like Ernie Kovacs is the earliest innovator of that particular form, but it's come to take over pretty large swath of comedy television that's not like ongoing scripted fiction stuff like uh you know a lot of this feels like the mr show movie or something even uh -huh. the the like tone of it where it's like we don't care it's a movie um we're almost like rebelling against the idea of this being a movie yeah 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 that's i like the way i like the way you, you put that i mean they're 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 yelling at the 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 projectionist and right, the projectionist is, like, trying to make it with some lady, and, like, he literally destroys the film on the film. Yeah, and the... And the and yeah, like, right, right, right. Or, yeah, she's... And, like, cuts the leads in half by, like, not paying attention to the projector. Right, because, yeah, the projector goes, and it's, like, the bottom half on the top, the top half on the bottom, it gets... Yeah, it gets moved. And that, like, One anarchic spirit, it, down. Yeah. It, it even allows for, like, what Ron informed me as we were watching, because he, he looked it up, um, just ran Randomly, like a jazz band shows up, they're incredible. Like, yeah, like those guys could play, and and then just these people start Lindy Hop dancing, and it's like that's amazing. It yeah, it, it's so weird to me because like I, I knew these old guys that were obsessed with Lindy Hop when I was a kid, and it was always just kind of like the it was like if you were too much of a dork for the people that showed up for the swing dancing things <laughs> once a month at the city center, and no, and they're like Lindy Hop dancing, and it looks like it's. It's wild, you know. You think these people are going to injure themselves? Or yeah. Something. Like I, I haven't seen anything that intense in like a mosh pit. A, I, much I, like and, and like they're doing it gracefully, and like you can tell these people yeah. are like these people are incredibly skilled, talented dancers. Well, the, the, you get um, where you get the the pairs of dancers, the man and the woman, and they're dancing so far apart and angled in such a way that the only reason that they're able to stay up is they're holding hands, and that centers that moves their center of the center of gravity to the middle if they let go they both like fall crashing tumbling over um so they depend on each other so much and that's oh yeah he's like wiggling her like a rag doll in the air yeah. and then she just gets up and she starts dancing again and i'm like yes. how, how the hell did you yeah. do that and you know they have the, the ginger fred and ginger had nothing on them mm. and then later on we get to gene kelly and they're still still well i mean gene like kelly that. couldn't dance as well like so fred astaire's sister was a better dancer than fred astaire but oh, she really? married a rich guy before talkies got big. Hmm. That's the, I mean, granted also like patriarchy, blah, 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 but if she'd really wanted to make it in the movie, she could have made it in the movies. Um, she could have been as big as Ginger. <laughs> I, oh my God. Well, I mean, no, the thing Ginger, is like Ginger, as as Ginger, so. Ginger is not as good a dancer as Fred Astaire. Like, given... No, no. Remember, she had to do it all the same and backwards. She's not doing it. I have those movies over there I could show you. She's basically doing like a very simple
simplified version of everything he's doing. She also, like, he did all the choreography, figured out okay. how the camera was supposed to be situated. And I'm not saying this to shit on Ginger Rogers, because, like, Ginger Rogers didn't have a formal dancing background. Really? Uh, not compared to... I mean, Fred Astaire was dancing basically the same way that, like, Buster Keaton was getting, like, thrown around and, uh-huh. like, having things fall on his head. Like, he was dancing pretty much on, like, a near-professional level just because that's how the world worked, I guess, at that point from, like, God, I mean, probably from the time he was, like, five or something. Um, yeah, you know, he's, he's, like, one of the, like, Jerry Lewis, I think, was the last one of those guys where they literally just grew up in vaudeville. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I don't know if Fred Astaire ever even went to, like, school. Oh, no kidding. Um, so, yeah, uh, how do we get an, oh, how's the, <laughs> oh, the Lindy Hop, the Lindy Hop. So, actually, if you look it up, it's actually, yeah, it's a, it's a famous scene. It's a uh, um, which if it's a famous scene which you may have never seen. <laughs> right. So if you look up Hell's look Pop it up, and Lindsay yeah. Hop, Lindy Hop, not Lindsay Hop, right? Lindy Hop. Uh, Lindy Hop, yeah, L I N D Y, yeah. which is a very specific subset of swing dancing. And so the the people the 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 Lindy Hoppers are called uh, the the troupe is called Whitey's Lindy Hoppers. Um, and they were in the original, um, in the, in the, in the show, in the, mm-hmm. the live, uh, I guess Vaudeville. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it wasn't Vaudeville. I forget. The, the, the Broadway. I mean, yeah, Broadway, Broadway was basically theater. like the, the high end of Vaudeville, right? Cause yeah, like yeah. live theater was a much larger part of the entertainment ecosystem around, well, not, I mean, 1941 movies had, movies were well on their way to killing anything that looked like Vaudeville, um. But so they were in the original, they were in the stage production. Um, and then they're, they're the, it says that they're the only ones except for Olsen and Johnson. Um, and then there was the, the jazz, the jazz band was Slim and Slam, as famous for their onstage antics as their musicianship. You don't get that much antics, you get a little tiny bit of that, the way they're, they're talking. But it is they, they're doing it with some jazz flair, yeah. And, and they're, I mean, doing they're also flair. doing it in a chef outfit, or one of the guys at least is yeah, like yeah. wearing a giant chef hat, and he's like, all right, time to play jazz, I'm done eating bacon dinner, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing starts like like two people start playing, and then there's all these people, all the uh, people who work at the house. Where this whole thing takes place at a mansion um, or outside the mansion. Right. Um, we never see any of them again at any point in the movie. Right. There's no nothing setting them up. It's just like we want to have this sequence in the movie. It's yeah. gonna happen, and then it ends in no. Then they just disappear. You can literally like take it out as a music video, which right. now that we have YouTube, somebody's done that. But you get stuff. You get the chef. You get the the, the chamber made um and uh you know cleaner and all and all that you know and folks like that and they end up all coming together and and dancing and singing they're all black mm. um there's no other black people in the movie and then like right. a, like a movie of that of that era you don't have white and black people or or very commonly you don't have white and black people um well it's almost scene. like less so offensive i feel like in this movie because when you when you have like white and black people together in movies of that period it always like they're like beating you over the head with the fact that the black person is this loyal servant right uh or you know person of uh could be an elevator operator right could be an elevator it, it's somebody in a menial job who is there essentially for people's uh, uh non-black people's uh, comfort or amusement right um and we, we were even talking during the movie about step and fetch it who another incredibly talented tap dancer you know he's in a He's in a bunch of John Ford movies. He's in um Really? Yeah, he was I mean, he was a huge movie star in the nineteen thirties, but he's always cast as like this kind of Sambo who happens to get to tap tap dance. Right. And it's uh you know, and that's like a huge it, it, it's kind of ironic because, like, John Ford ended up making one of the great movies about, like, racial tension much, much later, uh, The Searchers. But those 30s westerns, yeah, this is, yeah, like, yeah. cringy, cringy. Any time that race comes up, it's just well, now, stagecoach. That's what I'm thinking of. There's, like, a big <laughs> step and fetch a dance sequence. In a, All right, we gotta we got to watch that. There's another, you know, our <laughs> list of we got to do this for the podcast list is just has grown astronomical. But there, there's another. One stagecoach. Mm. Yeah, stagecoach. Some John Ford in there somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, there's well, the Long Voyage Home. I think would be a great one too, because that's like such a you get to see J- 
John John Wayne does a terrible Swedish accent, which is worth the price of admission. Oh, we talked about that briefly, yeah. I think, because I was uh, mentioning uh, How Green Was My Valley. and uh, Yeah, and I think, like, that. Long Voyage Home might be the single best the movie ever made about alcoholism. Huh. Um, well, I don't know. Have you seen Shakes the Clown? Oh, I love Shakes the Clown. Shakes the Clown is a pretty good movie about we, we alcoholism. We need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Have you ever seen Sleeping Dogs Lie, the other Bobcat Goldthwait movie? Um, it's not very good, but it's... I've seen another one, so it must be that. You know. uh, yeah, it's like the, the woman gets into a relationship and she can't figure out how to tell her, bo- her new boyfriend that she blew a dog in college. I do not remember this. So maybe I did not see it, but I swear, unless I'm confused. I mean, I think he's done three or four. Like writing them. Okay, okay. So there. Yeah, um, he's, he's I've been seen a director one. for a while. Yeah, I saw yeah. something besides Shakes the Clown that uh, I believe he directed. Um, but yeah, well, Shakes the Clown, that's great. And he th- Shakes the Clown. Yeah, you think, oh, it's just going to be a comedy. And I'm like, well, no, actually, it's a, I mean, it is, but it's also, it deals with alcoholism pretty seriously and pretty, uh, you know, head on. So. Yeah, I mean, Bobcat is a surprisingly deep dude for somebody who initially made his living destroying furniture and making screechy noises <laughs> yeah. on a Johnny Carson show. Ah. But back to, so Step and Fetch It, he was actually a big movie star, right? Then we look down yeah. on, on now the, you know, the, the way that the characters like and the treatment, but he was actually a pretty, you know, a, a, a lot I of mean, the African-American actors. The, those were the only roles that they had available for them. Um, but, you know, they did they did great. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it's like the same it's thing is like Por- Porgy and Bass, like <laughs> not the most progressive thing by 2019 standards. Um, you know, certainly the, the like the dialogue and the attempt at, at kind of like African-American dialect yeah, yeah. Um, is in, in downright embarrassing at this yeah. point. But at the time, um, <laughs> Gershwin was the only guy who was like, I insist that you actually cast black people uh-huh. in this production. Huh. Like, as opposed to doing blackface. Yeah, as opposed to just getting a bunch of like, you know, Bill Murray, not, not, or Billy Murray, shall I say. Billy Murray, who was a very famous crooner in that period, not Bill Murray from Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, just like slap some grease paint on his face and yeah. like, oh, I love eating watermelon. Oh, Billy Murray. You know, like, like that that kind of... And I mean, there's a lot of that in old movies. And and, and also with, with film preservation, like you, you run into this problem of like, this guy's this incredible tap dancer... Uh, with with Stephen Fetchin, Fetch right? Billy Murray could not dance to save his life. But uh, this is historically important. What do we do with this, right? Because like the, the the most offensive Looney Tunes cartoon that's never been re released in any form whatsoever, Cold Black and the Seven Dwarves. Oh, I don't. Uh, oh, which wow. yeah, John but... Kay owns a sixteen millimeter print of that. Um, uh, the guy who created Ren and Stimpy. Oh, okay. I remember, right, and it's like it's a piece of animation like on a technical level it's it's exceptional you got these like very talented uh jazz musicians etc all contributing to the thing but it's still horribly horribly racist yeah, so okay. like do we completely erase these people's work because that's what was available to them at the time just erase these people from history you, you know and there's no right answer it's like it, you keep it in what is the museum of film and television is that what it's yeah called? you keep it at the paley center yeah, yeah. well they okay. used to be called the museum of tv and radio and then somebody named Paley gave him a lot of money, I think, oh, okay. when I, at some point when I was in college. Hey, if you're going to give us a lot of money, we'll happily name anything you want after after you. Cause, uh, uh, oh, we should talk about the Super Friends at some point. Oh, we should, we should. And that's the end of part one of our discussion of Hell's a Poppin', or, you know, whenever we actually got around to mentioning the movie. And next time, we'll get to part two, a little more talk about Hell's a Poppin', as well as finally watching an episode of Super Friends. It's been a little while, so we got to catch up a bit. All right, see you all next time.